thanks you so much for joining uh, us on what I guess is becoming a bit of a recurring uh, uh, series for us. Um, so as many of you know, we had Frank and Minojan back in October of last year. Um, and it was a great event overall. So we have some familiar faces here. Uh, with that, I am pleased to welcome back to some Zero Minoj from Nani of 93 East Capital and Frank Kelly of Fulcrum Macro Advisors. Now, just for some background on the two of them, Manoj is the founder and CIO of 93 East, a global macro hedge fund he founded in 2021. Manoj um, brings 18 years of investment experience, having served as an economist and strategist at J.P. Morgan Chief Investment Office, Sampo International, and Quadratic Capital. At J.P. Morgan, he advised the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee and was responsible for analysis of the 2008 subprime mortgage uh, crisis. Frank Kelly is the founder and managing partner of Fulcrum Macro Advisors, a strategic advisory firm. Frank brings over 30 years of experience across both Wall Street and Washington, having led government affairs for both Deutsche Bank and Charles Schwab. He was previously chief of staff for investment banking for Merrill Lynch in New York and served as a senior policy advisor to Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Frank is also involved in numerous professional and academic affiliations, including the Council on Foreign Relations, the Scowcroft, Scowcroft Group, and Center for Strategic and International or Center for International and Strategic Studies. So, uh, I also told Frank I wouldn't call him Grandpa yet, but Frank is about to welcome his first grandchild this week. So, big congrats to you, sir. Thank you very congrats. much. All right. Well, great to welcome you both. Um, like to kick things off, handing things over to Manaj here. Um, as everybody knows, we have an FOMC meeting coming up next week. Um, inflation measures have come down materially since we last spoke, but um, they still remain significantly elevated over the Fed's target here, Manoj. So what are your expectations for the decision next week, incorporating some of the recent data points and developments we've seen? Um, you know, would love to kind of get your thoughts to kick things off here. Yeah, thanks, uh, Griffin, for, for having me. Uh, and uh, congratulations, Frank, in advance. Uh, hope all goes well this week. Um, okay. As far as, uh, you know, the Fed's concern next week, I think we're going to get a dovish 25 bips and a pause. Um, you know, we're going to move the funds rate from 4.75 to 5% range to 5 to 5.25% range. Um, I think the reason you're going to get 25 bips is right now the market's expecting it. Uh, the market's pricing for it. Uh, sort of all expectations are set. Um, I mean, I would argue that, you know, all of last year was a surprise in general. I mean, if you were sitting here in like, you know, in, in April, 2022, and told me that we would have a 5% fund, Fed funds target in about 12 months. You know, we just had the first anniversary of the Fed hiking cycle. Uh, you know, that entire thing would have been surprising and sort of the way it's panned out. But, you know, for pretty much most of last year, you know, as we got to March, April, and as, as you know, sort of, uh, you know, the, the months transpired, uh, the, the Fed started getting priced in around CPI and payroll prints, right? And you had this sort of, you know, always an eight, six to eight week gap between Fed meetings. And within the first two, three meetings after uh, every Fed meeting, the next meeting would start to, start to get priced in. And you had one surprise in June uh, when, right. you know, the, the two days before the June 15th meeting, you had sort of the leak, you know, the so-called leak in the journal where you, you basically sort of pre-announced a 50 basis point hike versus a 25 basis point hike. So, you know, I don't think that's the case mm -hmm. now. Um, I don't think they're gonna surprise markets. There's no need to surprise markets. We're just coming off a sort of a, you know, perhaps what some may call a idiosyncratic bank issue. Um, and right yeah. now, you know, you sort of have payrolls, uh, you know, moving the right direction. You have inflation moving in the right direction. I would actually argue at this point, you can make an intellectual case for 125 bips in May and then another 25 bips in June. But I think they're gonna sort of, you know, just hold back uh, and, and wait to see if the markets move them to another 25 basis points in June. But I think at this point, we should be expecting, you know, I think they'll do a 25 bips, a devilish 25 bips. Appreciate that, Manoj. Um, now, obviously the last month, we've seen some shocks to the financial sector, right? Um, you know, multiple failures among smaller U.S. depository institutions, and then that shotgun marriage we saw between uh, Credit Suisse and UBS. Um, you know, it seemingly subsided in the last couple of weeks here. Things seem to have calmed down a little bit, but, um, you know, obviously that, that was a result of the Fed, you know, stepping in liquidity there. Um, do you foresee any further systemic risk here? And, you know, obviously you both have experience from 08. Um, it would be great to hear both your kind of thinking on this. 
Sure. Oh, John, do you, want to, you want to go? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll go quickly. Yeah. I, you know, I think the interesting thing about this was, um, and this was articulated well by some regulators, former regulators, members of Congress, that with the flick of a, uh, a tweet or a social media post, you can create a bank pa panic, right? You don't even have to. And there, I think that was very much true in this case. We saw mm -hmm. three banks, right, in terms of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Silvergate Bank go down. One, as far as I can tell, has nothing to do with the other. Signature had nothing to do with Silverlake. Um, and that was a pure crypto issue, which is a whole different kettle of fish here that uh, we're still sort of trying to unpack. And everybody that I have spoken to, uh, even some people actually at Signature, didn't see this coming and thought even two days before regulators were fine. Um, Silicon Valley Bank is a different, as I said, different kettle of fish under itself. And I think when we, well, let's just, let's just leave it to what we saw in the congressional hearings on this. Nobody knows what happened, right? Everybody's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, you put five economists in a room and you come out with 10 different opinions. Sorry, apologies to the economists, but you know what I'm saying? It was this, it was that, this is a bank that operated for nine months without a chief risk officer. Uh, and the Washington yeah. Post did a very good piece on this uh, that you can find online that says when the risk models started flashing red, SBB's senior management changed the risk models. So I think when, when we get through, um, we get through all of this, we're going to see that there was systemic issues internally that were not addressed uh, and there's going to be more problems. So it's a long way of saying I'm not seeing any significant uh, new risk to the banking sector. And, and, you know, Credit Suisse, that's even a whole different kettle of fish. This is more about management and risk management as opposed to economic shocks, I think, taking down banks. Got it. I mean, you obviously uh, played kind of a key role in J.P. Morgan's response back in 08. So do you have anything to add there? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I largely agree with Frank. I mean, you know, it seems like more of an idiosyncratic uh, issue at this point rather than any, anything systemic, you know, that said, I don't think we're completely out of the woods yet, right? I mean, um, it may have been sort of a, a precursor to some other systemic issue that it's not, I mean, nothing's visible to me right now, but I just sort of go back to like, you know, 06, 07, uh, you know, in the summer of 2007, you had uh, s and downgrade, 300 RMBS issues, like on a Friday evening after close um, that, you know, sort of was supposed to be limited to like those 300 RMBS securities uh, as 300 RMBS issues. And then sort of over the course of the following six to eight months, things sort of evolved in, in different ways. Right. Um, and, you know, you kind of mm -hmm. had this downgrade of like banks on last Friday evening by Moody's. I, I don't, I, I definitely think at this point it's idiosyncratic. I mean, you know, we can go into a lot of detail about what exactly happened in those 48 hours. And, uh, you know, obviously as Frank mentioned, they had their the hearings and, it looked like uh, from the initial set of hearings, and I'm sure we'll probably have another, you know, couple of rounds at least of, of hearings in Congress, you know, which, which Frank uh, might more know more about. But it came out very clearly in that round that uh, so the local Federal Reserve was increasingly worried about their positioning, uh, you know, in the, in the 12 months leading up to, uh, to, to March, uh, in the sense, you know, they even disclosed that you have these internal CAMELS ratings that, uh, that the regulators have, and that was you know rated as a three, with number one being the best and number five being the worst, and that started right. to downgrade Silicon Valley Bank, uh, you know over the, over the prior twelve months. So at this point, again, you know, if you just sort of look at the balance sheet and, and the way it was structured, uh, it definitely looks idiosyncratic. Uh, you know, that said, we'll just sort of have to uh, wait and watch to see how this commercial real estate situation uh, plays yeah. out uh, and whether or not. You know, we'll see more outflows from you know into money market funds from from the regional banking sector. So I think that's a little bit TBD. We'll know over the next six to twelve months. But for now, I think I agree with Frank. It's it's, it's it looks definitely idiosyncratic at this point. Got it. Yeah, Griff, yeah. Can I just add one quick point, just for the, the, the listeners? If you're sort of looking um, for where this goes next. And uh, Minaj, I think is absolutely right. There probably will be hearings, but remember the Federal Reserve, I think the first of, is it next week? 
or is it the end of the month? I can't remember. They're doing an internal review of the situation. There will be a report. So we will get something much more granular as to what was seen and, and missed. Excellent. Appreciate that, guys. Now, a uh, couple conversations I had this week with investors, um, you know, the debt ceiling conversations got brought up. So I'd like to ask you both about that. Frank, I think, could you give us just an overview of how negotiations are shaping up? And then I'd like to angle a second part of this question towards Minoj, which are the risks are that should an agreement not come to pass? You know, we've seen historically that these matters can can cause volatility, particularly in treasury markets. So would love to kind of hear this kind of uh, bifurcated response here. So sort of setting the table on this, um, there was the initial very friendly meeting between Speaker of the House McCarthy and President Biden. Not much since then. I would argue on both sides, they're, they're busy doing other things and knowing that the X date uh, is way off the distance, end of July uh, or August, which in Washington terms is years from now. Um, I, I think that there was, uh, for a variety of reasons, they decided to kick it up last week um, and that now we're gonna see a vote this week in the house on a package of cuts um, I could go into the details, but it's actually for the listeners, it's not worth it because none of it will survive. If, if they do get it passed through the House, it will not pass in the Senate. The point of it is almost sort of putting the shock panels, uh, paddles on the body to get the heart moving here on this. Um, I think the big question, though, is remember, this is unlike, I, I really want to stress this politically, unlike any other debt ceiling debate we've ever seen because of the politics involved, because of these hyper thin margin of victory or defeat in the House, a five seat majority uh, for Republicans. And there are 17 Republicans sitting in the House of Representatives right now who over the last 10 years in their service have never voted once in favor of a debt ceiling increase, not even during the Trump administration. And they're, most of them are Trumpers. Right, right. Manoj, do you want to handle the second part about potential impacts on the markets here? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, you know, uh, memories of 2011 or nightmares of 2011, the summer of 2011 <laughs> sort of come back. And, uh, you know, and actually, I just, just pulled out my book. I don't know if you've read this. I have a prop over here, The Price of Politics, Bob Woodward. Basically, right. you look at the back page, there's Boehner and Obama, like, talking. I don't know, Frank, you might, this might be etched in your memory, at least it isn't mine. And how that sort of thing played out over the course of summer of 2011, I mean, it was pretty brutal, right? Uh, and I think as Frank mentioned, one of the reasons we're getting a little bit more anxious about this, and you saw this move already in, in, in the bills market uh, over the past week is because, you know, last year, last week's tax receipts showed that they're running below uh, what was expected, uh, you know, after the tax filing deadline. Uh, so that's pulled up the the deadline or the X date, as it's called, a few weeks, you know, from late August to maybe mid to late July. Um, and um, I, if you sort of think about how things got re resolved in 2011, and obviously, you know, as Frank mentioned, we've had other uh, increases, uh, you know, between 2011 and now, is basically they agreed to this thing called the Budget Control Act, which basically put in, put in place, you know, a trillion dollars in spending cuts that were supposed to be negotiated through the course of 2012 that, uh, you know, ended in the fiscal cliff on December 31st, 2012, that eventually got passed, like, literally at midnight, you know, New Year's Eve between, you know, 2011, 2012 and 13. At that point, you know, you had the big Treasury rally in 2011. The issue is that once the uh, Budget Control Act was passed, basically, you had a trillion dollars of room to cut in government spending. So that kind of weighed on markets for the next 12 months. I mean, if you think through what happened sort of in, in those few months between July and August, 10-year notes rallied from 3.2% to 1.8%, which was a 150 basis point rally that had never sort of had been seen prior to that. Uh, and that was a big move. You know, we got the sovereign downgrade. Yeah. The S&P collapsed 12% in three weeks from 1350 to, to like, you know, 1200. The VIX spiked from 16 to 40 in about three weeks. Uh, the interesting thing is that the two stents curve at that point sort of kept its like, you know, in the 150, 140 bits 
range. And then one of the things the Fed did on September 21st is announced Operation Twist. Uh, so September 21st, 2011, that basically flattened the curve, right? And you basically, yeah. you know, basically bought long end treasuries to flatten the curve. This time around, we've already gone from, you know, negative 110 bips, you know, the when Silicon Valley Bank happened, you know, that weekend to negative 60 bips. So the, in, in the two tenths curve, and that's already so flat. I'm not sure what the Fed's going to do at this point, you know, say we get into a crisis situation. So I think it's going to be pretty volatile. I mean, you've already seen five-year CDS, U.S. sovereign CDS spreads sort of get back to you know uh, all-time highs. You've seen the the two the two-month, three-month, sorry, the one-month, three-month bill curve basically widen to 175 bips as of close of Friday, and you you really have this fear starting to build in build in the market. It's not visible in equities. It's not visible in the VIX but it's definitely visible in the treasury market, especially in the bill curve. And you know that basically the, the, the widening in, in one month, three month bills happened after data on the tax receipts started to come out. So I think we're getting to a point where, you know, as Frank mentioned, we may not get to it till the summer, but it looks like markets are starting to, to worry about it right now. Uh, as, as far as some markets, it's definitely not visible in the VIX and, 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 and in equity markets. And you know, even credit right. markets. So, I just what I, I totally I think that's a fantastic overview. And I would just yeah. add, that worry is good because as of a week ago, two weeks ago, what you were getting from members of Congress, they're pointing to the market and say, hey, the market doesn't seem to be too worried about this, right? We have to see the market show a reaction and fear in which, oh my goodness, default. There's another big piece of this, by the way where Speaker McCarthy has been doing a lot of quiet education for members. What will it look like if we default? Well, how does this yeah. play out, right? And you've got uh, Treasury saying that they're not doing a prioritization. Well, they're not officially doing a prioritization because if they officially do a prioritization, then Congress can ask them for it and they'd have to give it up. But does this mean Chinese investors get paid out first or is it you know, grandma and grandpa's pension plan? And for all of yeah. you who to vote against this, where are you going to stand on that? That kind of education, bringing in conservative academics, uh, thought leaders on this, and explaining it to those who have been reticent on, uh, on voting for it. I know for, for a fact at least two members who are a hard no are scared to death now not to vote, uh, that they have to vote in favor of this. That's uh, excellent insights from the both of yeah. you guys. Just now, sorry, I, just one more point on that. I mean, it's going it's to come up next week, right? At the, at the press conference. And as, as Frank mentioned, the Treasury is sort of unofficially preparing for it. They have to. It's their sort of, you know, it's, it's their responsibility to do so, even though they cannot officially announce it. I'm pretty sure the Fed's also doing the same thing. And Powell's going to get asked about it. And, as, you know, as Frank mentioned, he's not going to disclose anything, right? As soon as he says, we have this contingency plan, one, two, three, Right away, Congress is going to say, "Look, they have a plan. Like we're not going to do anything." So, so I think you know that's exactly. It, it's definitely going to come up next week, and and we're going to get a non-answer from Powell. Great. Well, well, thank you both. I mean, that was that was fantastic. I, I think you know, kind of combining these, the you know, Fed next week, you know, debt ceiling negotiations, this kind of fiscal financial crisis that we're in. Um, you know, what in your estimation have the odds of a, you know, sort of severe contraction in the U.S. economy um, increased or decreased in the last couple of weeks? Um, you know, we've already seen this kind of pullback in highly accommodative monetary policy. I'm kind of thinking about the implications of potential pullback on the fiscal side. Um, so, Minaj, I don't know if you want to kind of handle that one. Yeah, sure. On the fiscal side, and, you know, obviously Frank is in, uh, will know more about this. I don't think we're going to get anything from Congress at this point. Uh, anything yeah. more in terms of fiscal easing. I mean, it, it just given the way inflation has sort of panned out over the past like 18 months, more easing on the fiscal side, I think is, is almost, I would say negligible, but you know, Frank has a better opinion on that. As far as the contraction in the, uh, in the economy, I think, uh, you know, I would say like the, the strength in, in Q1 has been uh, surprising to many. Uh, we've created a million jobs. We're going to get Q1 GDP end of this week. It's probably in that like 1.8 to 2% range with possibly a surprise to the upside. Retail sales holding up. 
uh, PMIs, you know, ISM services at 59 in expansion. Maybe there's some weakness in, in auto sales, I mean, sort of uh, in the subprime auto market and then in sort of manufacturing PMIs, uh, you know, showing below 50. Um, I think as far as the economy goes, um, I think at this point, you know, even if you get into a crisis situation, I think it's it's somewhat not 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 significantly contractionary, uh, you know, because you sort of think of like the employment market is still pretty healthy. Uh, at the most, you know, I mean, you so you will have if you do have a drawdown in equities, that might sort of you know pull some consumption back. But you sort of given the way the, the U.S. consumer has been, you know, is behaving over the past eighteen months, I think it would take a significant change for them to sort of pull back in spending. So I think, you know, the effect, the economic effect might not be seen for at least one to two quarters. If okay. you do get some sort of a, a sort of negotiated bill saying we're going to actually do what, you know, Speaker McCarthy has, has sort of proposed with a $1.4 trillion, uh, you know, reduction in deficit spending, that might sort of show up in, in 2024 uh, in whatever sort of ways they decide to, to uh, cut spending. But at this point, you know, I would say it's not usually contractionary on, on its own, standalone. I mean, there has been sort of a bit of a downshift from the economy, uh, but I don't think it, it, it's like significant. In fact, like sort of this, this hard landing situation, I think is, is very uh, hard to see at this point sitting right now. Obviously things could change next week, but, but I think it's gonna be sort of de minimis. Got it, appreciate that. So I uh, wanna take our kind of thoughts global here now maybe first thing up, up top of mind here, it's now been 14 months since uh, the conflict in Ukraine escalated into full-scale war driven by Russia's invasion. Um, in the past six months, we've seen Putin order further mass mobilizations of uh, you know, Russian civilians. Uh, we've seen the West increasingly supplying advanced weaponry to the Ukrainians, and there's even talk of supplying them F-16s. Um, and largely kind of static, you know, lines being drawn, um, you know, despite sort of the, the conflict in the country's east right now. Um, Frank, how do you see things unfolding right now, um, you know, given that both sides seem to be digging in despite, you know, kind of bluster and, and talk of counteroffensives on, on sort of both sides? And I know you also want to talk about the grain deal um, that's in jeopardy right now. So I'll turn things over to you. Thank you. Look, I, I, I'm not a military expert. Um, I do talk to a lot of people, Pentagon and the Hill, who are focused on this. I think that we will see some sort of offensive from the Ukrainians. And then it's we wait to see what advanced weaponry that they've gotten, the Leopard tanks from, um, uh, from the Germans. There's now reports that Patriot missiles are now in, in place uh, or starting to come into place there. So we'll have to see where that goes. I, I think the general consensus and anticipation is the Ukrainians will regain, regain significant amount, sizable amount of territory. The question is Crimea. That's really what this comes down to. And for the Russians, that's the no-go zone, right? Because Sevastopol right. is a critical naval base for them that they've had possessed since the 1700s and one of two yeah. warm water naval ports. So can they retake all of Crimea? I, it's maybe, uh, I'm kind of doubtful, certainly at this point. And, and then at that, and then where are we say at the end of the fall, beginning of winter next year, are we basically in a world war one scenario of trench warfare, picking up, you know, small pieces of, of land back and forth. I think from a market perspective, it's, it, it's just smart and safe to anticipate this is going to continue to grind on for several years at the very least. But Griffin, as you, as you mentioned, um, and one of the things I want to talk about, you, you have uh, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov meeting with Secretary General of the UN today as we speak to talk about the Black Sea Grain Initiative. And this is the, for those of you who are not familiar with it, very briefly, it's, it's the UN broker deal be, uh, where both Ukraine and Russia are allowed to export uh, critical uh, cri uh, cereals, agriculture, fertilizer, uh, without attacking each other. And the Russians are now demanding very significant concessions, including lifting of sanctions, agricultural banks, et cetera, which the West is never going to do. And furthermore, as G7 has been quietly talking amongst themselves, a wholesale 
uh, export ban of anything to Russia, and in which the Russians are now saying, if you do that, we're out. Well, the implications of this is a massive food security uh, situation because those grain cereals um, uh, feed a big piece, something like 50, 60 million people in the world, particularly in Africa, the Middle East. 75% of sunflower oil uh, that is used for cooking in India is uh, imported from Ukraine, right? So you, you're just seeing these, a huge impact there, which would be, I would say, very inflationary. It would, um, it would be certainly a horrific humanitarian crisis and probably create a second humanitarian crisis because you, the anticipation is if, if this does happen and, and that there is this cutback, you would see basically uh, a lot of people, certainly from the Middle East and Africa, trying to go to Europe just to eat, just to survive. So this is a big deal and we need to keep an eye on that, particularly as we're seeing drought conditions in Argentina, Europe, right. uh, parts of Brazil, et cetera. Got it, got it. Now I, I wanna focus our attention on, on APAC right now. And Manoj, this is probably a question for you. One headline that caught my attention recently was um, newly installed Bank of Japan uh, head uh, Katsu Ueda, you know, say that the BOJ might be reconsidering its yield curve control policies. Um, what would be the implications for this for both the Japanese economy and for fixed income markets more broadly, given Japan's presence as a player in the international debt markets? I think, you know, he's obviously playing it very carefully. He hasn't had his first DOJ meeting yet. Uh, yeah, we'll hear from him on the 28th, uh, three days from now. Um, and so far, he's been sort of consistent, basically saying that there is no need to review the 2013 joint statement right now. He said that after his meeting with the prime minister, at the G7 finance meeting, he repeated that in parliament last week. Uh, you know, that said, uh, you kind of start to see price pressures uh, in, in Japan. And, you know, perhaps at the first board meeting, which will be, you know, at the end of this week, uh, that's the first time sort of he's probably going to sit down and be the chair and hear the views of the others. It's possible that once we get to the June meeting, just sort of given uh, the way price pressures are increasing in Japan, is that we could get, you know, shift in the yield curve control policy, moving it from a, you know, plus 50 bits, plus minus 50 bits range to a plus minus 100 bits range. I think the, the, the consequence of that uh, would be that you know, basically you would, at this point, the, the immediate effect will be, you know, basically a rally in the Japanese yen. And, you know, perhaps sort of maybe the, the JGBs again have the ability to become a, a flight to quality uh, 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 fixed income in instrument. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't know how that's gonna be possible, but, but at least it preserves capital, right? But at, at this point, I think that the biggest move would be just a, a quick stre strengthening the Japanese yen uh, with, you know, just, just making the JGB just slightly more attractive from a, a flight to safety uh, standpoint as opposed to a yield uh, or a carry trade. But appreciate that. Um, now staying there, you know, China has gone about its grand reopening and seen some internal, internal political posturing that solidified <laughs> Xi Jinping's power base. Um, Manoj, what are your, some, some of the early takeaways you've seen on the economic front in terms of China's reopening um, and how should investors manage expectations kind of given the, the geopolitical backdrop right now? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I think the initial data that has come out is surprised to the upside. I mean, arguably, this is sort of what happened after the reopening of the U.S. in Q1 last yeah. year as well. I mean, we got Omicron in December 2021. And then in Q1 last year, the economy, you know, it basically took off and which sort of resulted in all these hikes and inflation and so on. Um, but I think right now, like in, in my models, I'm modeling in 6% growth for China in, in 2023. I just, just think just given the, you know, the, the trajectory that we have in the first, I would say like eight to 10 weeks uh, sort of puts us on, on path for that. Uh, I mean, retail sales is better. Uh, the GDP announced was, was an upside. You see sort of the alternate data, subway rides, passenger flights, you know, export surprising to the upside, all sort of recovering. Uh, you know, one way to think about this is perhaps that we may have gotten the initial boost from the reopening and that things might start to slow down in, in the next couple of quarters. But just given the fact that we started so strong puts us on a you know, decent trajectory for, uh, for, 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 you know, 6% 2023 in China. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, sort of, you know, after that, that there are no more lockdowns that 
you know, happened as, as recently as Q4 last year. And they've just basically completely moved away from that. So the trajectory is sort of, the, the downside looks, you know, harder to, to envision right now uh, than, you know, sort of the upside. Yeah, and, and Frank, could you uh, maybe walk us through some of the progress the U.S. has made in terms of strengthening Indo-Pacific partnerships with some of our allies out there, both economically and militarily as a counterweight to China? You know, you saw it the other day how, you know, the National Security Review in China is targeting Micron. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's gamesmanship around the whole semiconductor industry. And we saw the U.S. put pressure on South Korea, for instance, to, you know, not fill that, that shortfall in potential chips, um, you know, that would cause by Micron sort of leaving the country as it were, right? But uh, could you speak more broadly about that, that whole situation? Well, this is, this is the new great game globally, isn't it? I mean, it's the EU, the U.S., South Korea, Japan, Australia, and increasingly India um, versus China and semiconductors is is the uh, is the football. So you'll see the uh, South Korean Prime Minister in Washington this week meeting with President Biden, putting a lot of pressure on him on this the Micron issue, as well as I should point out, uh, strongly encouraging. I'm going to put air quotes around that. Uh, for South Korea to start uh, providing lethal aid weaponry to Ukraine. That's a big deal. Um, yeah. I, what's very interesting is to, if you note the speech that Janet Yellen gave last week on China, it is this, we don't want to be your enemy. We want to get along. We're going to pound you economically uh, for superiority. You know, we're not going to lose our superiority and we're going to work with our allies on this. And the allies are... And India, I think, increasingly is in that orbit. Meanwhile, you were seeing uh, manufacturing leaving China, uh, not surprisingly, as China makes the, the turn from being uh, production to consumption. But um, uh, very interesting to see how um, uh, Apple now moving to India, opening its first store there, the flagship store. Um, this is this is the as I said, it's the new great game, and I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. And with that, and back to something that we were talking, Manaj and I were just talking about recently. I don't see any fiscal spending. However, I could see, and it would fall under fiscal spending, some variation of a Chips Act uh, add-ons to that, right? Because I believe the pharmaceutical industry believe, knows that they are uh, qualify for this. Bring it back from China, bring it here to the U.S., or friend shore it. I think that's all going to be playing into this in a big way. Right, right. Now, um, turning our way, our sort of focus here to another part of the globe, and but related to China, um, you know, one headline that I, I caught was this sort of whole Saudi-Iran uh, reproachment that has happened. Uh, Frank, what, what do you think this warming of relations means between, you know, these two countries that have basically been you know, historically antagonistic towards each other over the last two decades or so. Um, what, what does that mean for both those countries, the U.S. relationship with them, and then the broader Middle East, I guess, as it were? Well, look, I, I think that this is, um, if you want to call it a reopening, it is, I mean, they were reopening um, embassies, but this was more, my view, was geared to please their number one um, uh, client, China, in terms of uh, oil. Right. Okay. Uh, China coming telling him to knock it off. Right. You're, there's going to be no love fest there. There's this just this just goes back centuries. It's not going to change. I think that my concern is Iran is moving forward aggressively to build a nuclear weapon. And how long will it be before the Saudi Arabia has the same thing? Right. Right. OK, appreciate that. Um, now, I guess it's time for everyone's favorite subject, which is talking about U.S. elections a few years before they even happen. So, uh, you know, we've seen sort of an escalating war of words between the two ostensible front runners for the GOP nomination, uh, DeSantis and Trump. Uh, Frank, what what's sort of your your views of the uh, GOP kind of uh, kind of showdown right now? Uh, Griff, this is the part of the uh, discussion where I fake the internet going out. And <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, I, I think that we are very early days in this. Um, for investors, I would look at a couple things. One, where follow the money. How much money has Donald Trump actually raised for his presidential campaign? 
not all that. My understanding is he's raised 120, 130 million dollars plus since leaving office. But the last count I saw, and it's probably gone up a bit, only 14 million of it can be spent on a presidential campaign. The rest of it cannot be moved over. What's that say, right? How much is DeSantis making? Um, and I also think that you're going to see some very late comers into this race. I, I continue to watch Glenn Youngkin and others. Why get in at this point and get in the middle of the fist fight between Donald Trump and DeSantis? Last thing I would say is DeSantis is going to be very interesting to see how he is just launched on a round the world tour for uh, investment into Florida, but clearly it's for bigger purposes. His meeting with the Japanese right. Prime Minister today, going to Israel, going to the UK. And this is this is a big deal to help elevate his foreign policy um, uh, perception, and, I, and that will be something that President Trump can't do now, right? Nobody's nobody abroad is meeting with him, and I'm not certain he's gone abroad since leaving office. So it's early days. I would wait more till August. First Republican uh, debate is August. I'm not certain that even matters. I could see somebody coming in, a Republican coming in October, running a guerrilla marketing campaign based on social media after these guys have all beaten themselves up. Okay. Interesting. Do you think there's any other dark horses that, you know, we should kind of keep our eyes on? You mentioned Youngkin, but anyone else sort of uh, come to mind? Chris Christie, I think, is uh, not so much of a dark horse, but there was very little reporting on this that he met with, I think, 70 of his supporters and former campaign staffers here in Washington that clearly was a organizing rally that he wants to get mm -hmm. in. Also, Governor Sanu from New Hampshire, I think, is on the cusp as well. Okay, interesting. Um, so sort of my, you know, kind of final question before we can wrap things up here is, you know, the last few weeks, we've seen a lot of doom saying about the U.S. dollar and challenges to its dominance as the world's, you know, reserve currency, you know, primarily from emerging but economically powerful nations like China, you know, Brazil. Um, I'm going to toss this up to the both of you. What do you guys think about that? Is there a real challenger to the U.S. dollar or is this something we don't, you know, we should we, you know, should kind of spade here? Minaj, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. OK. I mean, you know, to me, this is just uh, a lot of entertainment. You know, this reminds me of this <laughs> this discussion that uh, that came up a few years back around this, like, you know, Treasury Secretary Yellen proposing this 15 percent global minimum tax. I mean, it's a fine. It's a nice concept. You know, this this concept of like moving it from the dollar is like, uh, you know, it's like a, it's a nice concept for like, you know, for some like Brazil or a few other countries. but. In reality, it, it just, I mean, to me, this is always a generation away. Uh, perhaps it might take, you know, another 30, 40 or 50 years. The only thing that might have changed just with sort of, you know, getting rid of uh, Russia from the, the SWIFT banking system and, you know, some countries sort of keeping an eye on that, it may have moved that timeline from say 50 years to 45 years. Uh, it's still something that that's way out there, far out there. I mean, if you just think of the data and the numbers, right? I mean among for us i mean for global international transactions 45 percent is conducted of those transactions happen on the us dollar the next competitor is the euro which is at 15 percent and the euro took about right. you know close to like 25 years to get here uh the japanese yen is nine percent and the cny is less than three percent and i can tell you just like just from you know just because i'm from india and i have family there and i go visit first for india and china to work on a common currency together I just don't think it's feasible, at least in the next like decade or two. There would be need to be a, a sea change culturally. I mean, you know, obviously the euro was developed across like cultural differences between you know France and Spain and, and Great Britain and, and Italy and so on. But those cultural differences are so wide and vast. I mean, I don't even believe you're having this discussion. But but anyway, just for for this <laughs> for the purpose of having it, uh, you know, I, I think at this point, it, it's sort of good entertainment at this point it, it's several decades away that's the way i look at it got it i completely agree with Minaj. the only thing i would uh, add to this though is the debt ceiling if we fail to get a debt ceiling agreement the enemies of this country are going to be hammering our way internationally as to why you can't trust the dollar and right it's going to be just a chipping away chipping away and it advances that timeline to some degree not a lot 
but we just can't keep doing these things. And I, that's what I worry about the most. But at the end of the day, where's anybody else going to go? Where are you going to take it? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's no viable alternative, I think, is sort of the main point. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Well, well, guys, I thought that was great. You know, we, we ended the last one on a bit of a interesting uh, note. You know, I asked you guys for kind of your shock, you know, prediction for the six months. Um, you know, curious to know, um, you know, circling back to that, Minaj, I remember you said like lithium, for example, was your um, kind of uh, a strategic kind of thought of yours, right? You know, looking forward over the next six months now, um, what's the same one for, what's the same question? I'm going to pose the same question to you guys. Um, what's kind of your, you know, black swan or, you know, maybe something people aren't paying attention to right now that they should be? Let Frank go first. <laughs> um, the Red Sox win the World Series? No, I... Uh, I would love that. I would personally love that. I, I, look, I, I think the I think the black swan situation is rooted in the commodity space. I worry. I do worry about the black sea grain initiative with climate situation, food prices, etc. That could be, uh, in many ways, that is Putin's nuclear weapon. He doesn't have to drop a nuclear weapon. He can just screw up the commodity situation globally. And how how do you how do you deal with that? Uh, that's that's what I'm most worried about for the moment. Got it. Great. Um, no. From my perspective, you know, I think it's more for gray swan, uh, less of black swan. I mean, the black swan is like a clear, like, you know, the debt ceiling that's sort of up front and center. But the way I'm thinking about this is, you know, the just the U.S. economy, right? Uh, there's this sort of expectation that we're going to get to the end of 2023 and the Fed's going to start an easing cycle. The, the issue I'm having with that is, you know, um, you could very well envision a scenario where this tension between growth and employment remains unresolved in the sense that you continue to get like, you know, the one, 2% growth in GDP, payrolls continue to print at 50, 100K. I mean, you might get an idiosyncratic, you know, hurricane or snow or storm or something else that might take one or two payroll prints to negative 50K. And, you know, yeah. inflation sort of settles back at this 3% range, right? Where the Fed really cannot, like with inflation, core inflation at three, like in the three to like, you know, 3.2% range and no visibility of that reducing, say we get to Q4, inflation remains high, growth remains pretty okay. And the Fed's just not in a position to execute a series of rate cuts. Uh, what that means is that you kind of have this tension sort of keep building up into 2024. And to me, it's sort of this odd situation where the economy is doing fine, which is why I call it grace one, because you continue to get a payroll growth, but inflation just, just doesn't move closer to the 2.5% range. And and this tension remains unresolved and that sort of you know pushes back any housing market downturn into 2024. And we sort of continue to sort of move along with no resolution to the monetary policy. So that, that's where I'll leave it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Well, I appreciate that, guys. I do wanna, you know, I do see we have a bit of time left on the on the call. So you know, if there's anything you guys like to talk about, obviously, you know, kind of raise that. And I do want to pose, you know, uh, open things up for questions from the audience. So if anyone has something they'd like to ask Manoj or Frank, feel free to fire it into chat and I'll read it out. Um, but anything you guys kind of want to directly mention that maybe I didn't cover here or, or you know, we didn't touch on. You know, I'll jump in with one here that I tell uh, investors if you're looking for something that would be indicative of U.S. competitiveness in, uh, where key investment themes are going to come, one place to keep your eye on is this newly created U.S.-China uh, competition committee in the House of Representatives. These are very serious people running this committee, and it's uh, just lockstep bipartisan in their view. They, they can't move legislation because of, it's a select committee and the rules of the House, but uh, in many ways, this is kind of like a pre-pre-pre-venture capital fund. Their sole purpose mm -hmm. is to identify uh, manufacturing, uh, technological, you name it. Where are deficiencies to be competitive business-wise? And therefore, it's one that is it's a precursor, I believe, to like the CHIPS Act, okay, we're finding that in this particular sector, we're just, we, we're not existent versus China. We need to now start blowing billions of dollars of 
federal aid uh, to that sector to get it back up and running in the United States for national economic security purposes. National economic right. security purposes. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see what they end up pointing out because it's going to be an investment opportunity for a lot of people. Yeah, I think that's going to be a term that I think a lot of people are going to be using over the next few years and perhaps related. You know, Frank, we just got a question in chat, um, you know, talking about potential military action by China against Taiwan. You know, given sort of the moves, you know, recently, you know, for example, you know, I saw the U.S. military, you know, recently acquired, ba you know, better basing rights in the Philippines. Um, you know, we saw Taiwan try to acquire um, uh, U.S. anti-ship missiles. Um, do you think that accelerates China's timeline because they think that with a, you know, stronger sort of U.S. Pacific alliance, they won't be able to, you know, sort of execute on their goals here? I think, quite frankly, um, unless pushed too far, China does not want to invade Taiwan. I don't think that that's in the next two to three, maybe even five year scenario for several reasons. The one, the Ukraine war has shown them the impact of sanctions on a country that invades and China would be pummeled by that. Second, mm -hmm. what would China get out of invading Taiwan? They'd turn the, the, the island would be turned into a cinder. Right. And at that point, you're getting semiconductors, you've got the rock, it's back. Third, uh, President Xi would have to be explaining to the Chinese uh, on the mainland why they're invading and killing fellow Chinese, their relatives, if there's relations back and forth. Finally, right. I would say this, um, the, the sort of regional elections that took place last year uh, for state, state and local if you will, uh, municipal elections, saw the KMT, opposition KMT party sweep. It did extremely well. That may be suggestive that in the 2024 elections for president and for parliament, KMT could be in a very good position to have control. I don't think that Taiwan, that China wants to blow that. They don't want to be scaring Taiwanese voters to, to, to keep the party in place when a much more friendly KMT, where the former president KMT member just did a nine city tour of China uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that there's opportunity there to you know, keep things calm, reopen things. Let's see how that plays out. But again, I think for the, sh for the next two years minimum, I think the, the risk of, of an invasion is, is fairly small. Got it, got it. Well. I don't see any further questions in chat. So with that, I think we can wrap things up, guys. Uh, Frank, Manoj, <laughs> thank you so much for your time today. Um, you know, always appreciate you guys having you on the program. And uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, hosting you guys soon enough. I say another six months would be good. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Any good time. luck, Frank. Enjoy the Great. Same to you. Talk soon, guys. Yeah. Bye. Talk soon. Yeah. And uh, for everyone on the call, you know, we will have a replay available, uh, you know, that we'll distribute post call. Um, and from that, you know, this is uh, Griffin Marie in New York City, Sum Zero. Talk to you soon.